I will be talking about PLE and PADLA consensus. This is joint work with uh, Hubert Chen and Raphael Pass. And PLE and PADLA means the sound of thunder in Chinese. It also means fast, furious, and streamlined. Okay, I will begin by trying to define the problem we will, we will be trying to solve today. And behind all these cryptocurrency systems, we have a core protocol called the blockchain protocol. It's also called state machine replication and our consensus. So in state machine replication, we have a distributed system of nodes. And, and these nodes want to agree on a linearly ordered log of transactions. We care about two very important security properties, namely consistency and liveness. Uh, consistency says that all of the honest nodes must agree on the same log. And Leibniz says whenever I want to buy coffee, my transaction is going to get incorporated into honest nodes logs very quickly. Okay, so now if all of these nodes were honest and they correctly followed the protocol, then the problem is somewhat trivial and uninteresting. But what makes this problem really exciting is when some of these nodes can be corrupt. And these corrupt nodes can behave arbitrarily. They can deviate arbitrarily from the prescribed protocol. And even under such adversarial conditions, we want to make sure that the remaining honest nodes must satisfy these two important security properties. Okay, so this is the problem I'm going to try to solve in the rest of the talk. So now I said I wanted to talk about Pili Pala consensus. Okay, so the first surprise in the talk is I'm actually not going to talk about Pili Pala. Instead, I'm going to tell you, um, I'm actually going to walk you through step by step, how to derive an extremely simple consensus protocol. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll be able to construct Pili Pala yourself. Um, okay, and uh, you know, it's pretty late in the day, but if you stick to the end of the talk, I'm also going to tell you uh, a couple secrets at the end. Okay, so now let's begin, right? How do we construct a blockchain protocol? Okay, before I begin talking about the protocol, I want to set things up. And I want to mention, um, what do I mean by a block? And here's the block format. A block contains a pointer to the previous block called the parent's hash, right? Notice that the parent's hash binds not only to the parent, but also to the entire prefix of the chain. And this is just like in Bitcoin or Ethereum. There's a timestamp, which we will call an epoch. So for the rest of the talk, you can imagine an epoch is like a second, um, and the idea is we want to confirm uh, one block every second in the ideal case. And, and I'm going to assume a synchronous network, meaning that whenever an honest node wants to send a message, the message is going to arrive at all other honest nodes in, let's say, a quarter of a second. Okay, so of course the block wants to include the transactions it wants to uh, confirm. Uh, so there's nothing new here, right? So this is just how a, a standard block looks like. Um, I want to start with the most natural protocol, and I want to point out a couple of things that work for this natural protocol and a couple of things that don't work. And then I'm going to you know, talk about how to fix these couple of things that don't work uh, and eventually leading to a provably correct protocol. Okay, so the most natural protocol um, works by voting, right? So in every epoch, we are going to elect a proposer, in this case, the proposer is Iron Man, is Spider-Man. So the proposer will propose a block. In this case, Spider-Man proposes a golden block. Now everyone votes. If you are honest, you will follow the proposer's, proposer's suggestion. Uh, and in this case, because uh, Spider-Man proposed an orange block, everyone who's honest will vote for the orange. They'll cast an orange vote. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, as you can see, Loki is corrupt. And instead of voting for an orange block, he votes for these two blue blocks. Okay. So one thing I want you to keep in mind is that the honest nodes are going to vote uniquely in every epoch. In other words, in every epoch, I'm going to vote on the first proposal. I hear from the proposer, I'm going to vo vote for that block and only that block. I'm not going to vote for anything else. So this will come back again later in the talk, so just keep it on your mind. And now we wait until we collect enough votes. And whenever a, a block uh, gets votes from two thirds of the people, 
we say that it has a notarization and the block gets notarized. So when the block gets notarized, what does it mean, right? It means that um, many people have voted on the block, so there's high enough confidence that many want this block to be confirmed. Okay, so just quick recap. I've talked about the most natural protocol, which doesn't quite work yet. Um, and in this most natural protocol, you know, it goes by epochs, and in every epoch we have proposed vote, proposed vote. And when I propose, right, there's a, one little detail I omitted to mention. When I propose a block, I have to choose which parent does my block extend from. And most naturally, I want to pick the freshest notarized block currently in my view. Okay, when I vote, there are a couple things to check, right? As I mentioned, there's no double voting, um, but there's also something else that I want to check, right? What if I receive a block whose parent hash is something I don't recognize, right? What if I cannot find any prefix of the chain that matches the parent's hash? In this case, this proposed block might be corrupt, right? Maybe the proposer is malicious, and I don't want to vote for any block unless I've seen the parent chain, the parent block, and also a notarization for the parent block too. Okay. Um, as I said, unfortunately, this very simple protocol is some, still somewhat flawed, as you may expect. Um, well, in the ideal world, actually, it just works fine because when everyone's honest, what you are going to see is this, right? Here you have one, two, three, four, or five, and everything gets notarized in a linear fashion, and no block is skipped. So everything's all very nice. In the real world, however, some of these nodes can be corrupt and people may have crashed. Okay, so you are going to see some problematic scenarios. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on two particular problematic scenarios um, called double notarization and forking. Uh, and I will tell you how to overcome these problems. In fact, so let's start with double notarization, right? So what is double notarization? Um, if for the same epoch, I see two different blocks getting notarized, then that's not too good because I wouldn't know which one to choose from. But in fact, the first thing I'm going to tell you is that this is not a problem because the very simple protocol I've told you about already overcomes this problem. And in fact, I can prove a theorem which says, you know, double notarization can never happen. In other words, for every epoch, at most one block can ever get notarized as long as the adversary controls less than one third of the, uh, the nodes. Okay, so here's the very simple proof. This cannot happen. And here's the very simple proof. Uh, in this picture, we see two thirds people voting for the blue block and two thirds people have voted for the orange block. And what we want to show here is that the blue block has to be the same as the orange, right? Because it cannot be that both get notarized. Okay, so now there are only n people in total, right? If you see the blue set and the orange set, then the intersection must contain at least one third of the nodes. And remember the adversary controls less than one third. And what this says is that there must be an honest guy in the intersection. And remember what I said about honest people, they are going to vote uniquely every epoch. So if that honest guy who lives in the intersection has voted for both the blue and the orange, then there is only one explanation. That is the blue block is the same as the orange block. So that's the end of the consistency proof for every epoch. Okay. So we've ruled out the first of these problematic cases, and now I want to focus on the second one, which is slightly more interesting, uh, that is forking. So what I will do is the following. I will, I will use the same problematic scenario, which is what you see on the slides, and I will use this scenario to motivate two very simple fixes to the protocol I've just described. And at the end, we'll have a provably correct protocol. Okay. So now, let's look at this problematic scenario together. Okay, I see at least two issues with this example. And one is that the block two is being skipped. So before I start, everything here is notarized, 
And from this point on, I'm only going to draw the notarized blocks, OK? So the first problem I see is that block two is being skipped. And the second problem I see is that the block five is, is extending from three. And it's not extending from the block four. And that's why it's creating a fork. OK. So the second problem is really what I want to focus on. But before that, I have to explain why we are even allowing blocks to be skipped. And this is, in some sense, necessary if you want to have liveness, right? Because it could be that the proposal number two is corrupt, and he failed to propose anything. And naturally, in that case, nothing will get notarized in epoch two. OK, so now if we allow skipping, then what you might see is the following, that the block five is extending from three and not four. So what, what could have happened in this case? OK, so there are a couple, application, a couple interpretations why this might happen. And the most natural one is perhaps the following, right? So the proposal five may be corrupt. And even though he has seen the block number four notarized, he doesn't like some transaction in this block. So he wants to undo this entire block. So now he chooses to build from three instead. OK. If you think about this and generalize from here, you'll realize that this can get pretty bad, right? Because a corrupt guy can just choose to extend from some really ancient block in the past. And this is problematic not only because it breaks linear linearity, also because you know, what happens to all the work that has been done in the middle? Right? What happens to all these notarized blocks in the middle? Right? We can't just undo all this work. OK, so this is actually pretty easy to fix, right? Um, this was the protocol we looked at. And you know, the problem is that people may propose some block propose to extend from a block that's way, way in the past. And I don't want this to happen. So what I'm going to say is honest people are going to insist on the parent block being fresh enough. And what if I see a proposal that proposes to extend from an ancient block in the past? I'm just not going to vote on this block, right? This must be a bad block. OK. So now, to make this more concrete, I have to explain what I mean by fresh enough, right? I want to check the parent block is fresh enough. But what does this actually mean? And the most natural interpretation is the following. Suppose I've seen some block notarized, and I'm going to insist on this block being included as a prefix in the proposed block of the future. If the proposed block of the future doesn't include this notarized block I've seen as a prefix, I'm just not going to vote on it. OK, so this is like almost there. Like it's almost correct. In fact, this works for consistency, but it's just a little too strong for liveness. And why is it a little too strong for liveness? Well, if you think about it, um, the proposal happened half a second ago. Right? So remember, each epoch is one, one second. The proposed phase is half a second. The voting phase is half a second, right? The proposal happened half a second ago. And I'm comparing the proposed block with my current view. But a lot could have happened in that half second, right? Maybe I've seen new notarizations in that half second. So if I'm going to hold the proposer up to this very high standard, it's very unfair to an honest proposer. And that's why we don't have liveness. OK, so if you want to fix the liveness issue, not only do you want to be fair to the proposer, you actually also want to give the proposer a little bit of advantage. You want to compare the proposal not with the present myself, but actually with myself just a little bit before the proposal happened. And in this way, I have time to propagate whatever I've seen to the proposer so he can pick it up, pick it up and include it in his proposal. OK. So this one second parameter is actually, it shows a trade-off, a tension between consistency and liveness. Um, and I won't go into the details, but I want you to take my word for it, that there is actually a right parameter in the middle that gets you both consistency and liveness. OK. So that's great. We've made some progress. And we, we are not there yet, but we are almost there. OK. So there is just one last thing I have to fix about this protocol to make it correct. And to motivate this last fix, 
I'm going to use exactly the same scenario and exactly the same question, right? So why does block number five choose to extend from three and not number four? Earlier we said, okay, probably the proposal five is corrupt and he, wants, he doesn't like some transaction in four, but perhaps there is another interpretation. There's an alternate world. And in this alternate world, four is the corrupt guy and five is honest. And I'm going to try to convince you how this can happen when four is the corrupt guy and five is honest. And here's a possible attack. So imagine now proposal four is corrupt. He divides the good guys into two camps, the blue camp and the orange camp. And he's going to propose the blue block to the blue camp and the orange block to the orange camp. And now people are going to vote differently. Now we have six people, right? So if you want two thirds votes, you have to collect four votes to get a notarization. In this case, if you gather together all of the honest votes, you don't have a notarization either for the blue block or for the orange block because we have three and two. But we must not forget that this corrupt guy himself has a vote, right? And if he now decides to make a vote for the blue block, he now knows the notarization on the blue block. And this is very much to the adversary's advantage because he's the only guy who knows the notarization on the blue block. And then now he can play it to his advantage because he can time exactly when he releases his last vote. And then he can you know, control exactly who sees the notarization first. Okay, so here's how the bad guy is going to exploit this attack. So for instance, at some point, the bad guy decides to um, review uh, the notarization on four to a single honest person, in this case, Spider-Man. And so this may, you know, we have already moved past Epic four, right? In sometime in Epic five, he releases the notarization to um, Spider-Man. At this very instant, no one else has seen the notarization on four yet. Everyone has only seen notarizations for one and three. So suppose at this very instant, everyone sees a proposal extending from three, right? Of course, this five guy, he hasn't seen notarization on four either. That's why he's building from three. And everyone's going to be okay with this proposal and they're all going to vote on it. And therefore the block five gets notarized even though actually, you know, later people find out there's also a notarization for four. Okay. So the problem with this case is that imagine in this split of a second when Spider-Man sees the notarization on four, if he hastily decides to confirm block number four, he's going to be in trouble because at the end of the time, he's just going to find out that there is another fork, the five fork, and that is the fork surviving to the end. So in this case, actually, the, even though four has been notarized, the block hasn't stabilized yet. Okay, so now, how do we fix this problem? Very simple idea. Again, you know, perhaps just seeing a notarization is not enough, right? You know, it, it may give me some confidence that many people have seen the block, but it doesn't give me high enough confidence. I want to be more paranoid. And what is paranoid? It is not enough to say I've seen a notarization. I want to make sure that many people have seen the notarization before I can confirm the block. And that's exactly the last modification I will talk about. And one question here is, of course I know when I've seen the notarization, how can I know when other people have seen the notarization, right? Um, so how can I know when other people have seen notarization? In fact, you can find evidence of it in the notarized blockchain itself. So imagine there are two blocks belonging to consecutive epochs and both are notarized. In this case, three and four are both notarized. And what this tells me is the following, right? So remember when I cast a vote for four, I have to check that I have a notarization for the parent. And in this case, the parent is three. In other words, if I see a notarization for four, it means many honest notes have voted for the block four, and simultaneously they're attesting to the fact that they have all seen a notarization for three in their epoch four. Okay, so now what this means 
is many have seen notarization for three in their epoch four. And in fact, if you do the calculation, more than one third honest people must have seen a notarization for three in their epoch four. And this actually, you can make such an inference every time you see two consecutive blocks both notarized, okay? Um, so now, in this case, actually three is safe for me to output for the following reason, right? Because imagine there's some epoch after four, let's say epoch number five. If the fifth proposer wants to build from one, that's going to encounter opposition because many people have seen three notarizing epoch four. They're not going to be happy if the block wants to extend from one. But if the proposer wants to extend from three or four, then that may be okay. Okay, so the idea is if many have seen the notarization, remember they are going to stick onto the block, insist upon it being included in any future proposal. And that's why that block will always be picked up by the, the future blockchain at the end of time. Okay, so the last simple modification is a slight modification to the finalization rule. I don't want to finalize when there's a notarization. I want to chop off some blocks at the end until I've chopped off one normal block. And what is a normal block? A normal block is a notarized block that's, um, whose parent is from exactly one epoch ago. So remember like in Nakamoto, right, in Bitcoin's protocol, whenever I see a chain, I want to chop off the last six blocks because the last six blocks haven't stabilized yet. And here it's very similar, but it's a modification of this rule. I want to chop off from the end until at least one normal block has been chopped off. And the idea is just like what I said, whenever I see two consecutive blocks notarized, then the first of the pair must have stabilized. Okay, so this is just the entire protocol. And just a quick recap, right? The protocol is really simple. It goes in epochs. Every epoch you have proposed, vote, propose, vote, propose, vote. Uh, for vote, I just have to be a little careful to check a few nice conditions hold, right? Including checking that I've seen the parent block notarized and, uh, you know, the parent being fresh enough. And this protocol, when combined with, you know, this paranoid finalization rule, gets you a provably correct protocol. Okay. So now is the time to reveal a couple of secrets. Um, as I said, I wanted to talk about Pili and Pala, but I didn't really talk about Pili and Pala, right? I talked about a protocol that tolerates uh, less than one third corruption and is secure in the synchronous uh, model. So what is Pili? Pili improves the resilience parameter to a half. It also works in the synchronous model, right? Because one third is not really tight for synchrony. And Pala tries to improve robustness, but in a different dimension. It tries to tolerate arbitrary partitions um, by working with what's uh, so-called the partially synchronous model. Uh, and I want to also mention another very beautiful work called Hot Stuff by Abraham et al. And there are also another instantiation of this idea uh, in this paradigm, uh, also in the partially synchronous model. And in fact, the protocol I talked about in this talk is partly inspired by the, the beautiful Hot Stuff work. Okay, so here's another secret I want to tell you at the end. What I told you about is not just an isolated protocol, it's actually a family of protocols um, that follow a very elegant paradigm called the pipeline BFT paradigm. And I want to explain this paradigm in just two sentences, right? In classical consensus like PBFT and Paxos, every time you want to confirm a block, it takes two rounds of voting. If you are familiar, for instance, with PBFT, you'll know that these two rounds in PBFT are called the prepare round and the commit round. And well, this is not ideal because why should there be two, right? Can we do the same thing with only a single round of voting? And the answer is yes. And it's a very, very simple, but very elegant idea, right? So why don't we just piggyback the second round on the next block's notarization? And if you do that, you can get this family of extremely simple consensus protocols like the one I've just talked about. And finally, I want to mention that this very elegant work, many of you know, Casper FFG. In fact, it's not explicit in their paper, but actually implicitly they're using this pipeline BFT paradigm as well. Okay, so thank you very much. And um, for Thunder, we have released Testnet. Uh, you should try it out. Thanks. <laughs>